uh, if you would be in a building like just like I just described, and then you are on the third floor, and then uh, somebody scream, "Fire! Fire! Run!" What would become important to you? Don't think too long. Just what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Don't give me all the Christian answer. Just be realistic. What comes first to your mind? Run. Okay, run, run. Run where? Run why? There's, there's fire in the building. Okay, no. Okay, when I, when I say what's important to you, I'm not asking what you're going to do, but what are you going to think about saving with you? Your wife. Your wife? Yeah, that's a good thing if you have a wife, yes. That's right. Save your wife. But I want to say that this is a lady speaking. She did not say save your husband. She said save your wife. So, okay, so we saw that here this morning. Oh, life. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought of my wife when you said that. I want to save her. So anyway, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you would make a list of what's really important to you, like in, in an urgent situation, what would you list that is important? Because, you know, at 8 and 12 a.m. in the morning when we were in this room, we were sleeping and we got up so quickly and without thinking, without thinking, I, I, I had nothing in my mind. I just didn't know what's happening. And that made me think about, you know, this old saying that, you know, I can wait on my deathbed or at the last moment of my life, I will be, you know, repenting or I will be making uh, good with God, you know, like uh, on my last moment. No, it doesn't happen like this. Things are moving so fast. You, you have no thought about a lot of things. You, your brain doesn't go fast enough to think about everything. So, so, so that day we were talking together about different things. Okay, what if a tsunami happens? We were in our uh, night clothes outside. We had put our passport, our money to the lobby desk and the security box. So we would have lost our passport, we would have lost our money and all of our clothes. And the only thing we would have had would be what we were wearing on that day, which is not very much. So what, what, do, we, what do we do at that time? What, what, how do we think about this? So later on that day after we went through a few strong uh, um, after shocks, we says, and we went to the room at one point after breakfast, and we had a big aftershocks again in the room. So you feel very insecure to stay in the room. So we says, okay, let's pack our bag. <laughs> let's pack our bag just in case. We, we need the bag to, to run because you need to run with something. So we will pack it ready next to the door because when you get to, into a hotel room, normally you just spread out your clothes here, there, your wallet, uh, your electronics and everything. So we just gathered everything else and put it back ready to go. And then we says, okay, let's, let's try to relax for the, the rest of the day, which, which we did. So what's really important? In, in our life, um, our passport, uh, my wife, of course, <laughs> my, my life, run for your life or something. In the Bible, Jesus tells us what's really important. I want to uh, take you in the Bible with me in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21. Jesus tells a parable that you are very familiar with. The land of a rich man produced plentifully and then he has to decide what he's going to do with all of the excess that he has. He's, he's rich, and he is so rich that he is not having enough space to put all of his wealth and everything. So he says, I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, I will store everything, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have a lot laid up for many years, just relax, sit down, and enjoy, enjoy, and that's it. But God had another opinion that seems to contradict what this man was thinking, this way of thinking. It says, fool, this night your soul 
is required of you. And these things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. What's important in this text, Jesus says, your soul or these things that you have prepared for yourself? Because there's a lot of things we are preparing for ourselves. That's normal. That's how we live. All of us. There's nothing wrong with that. We are preparing things. But Jesus makes us to discover this morning something more important. You know, you have things that are important and things that are more important and then you have the most important and that is what Jesus is opening our eyes to this morning are you rich toward God this morning like if it is your last day if it if the day you will you will go when Jesus will come again in the preceding verse and Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, beware, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how, how much you own. Your, your success is not measured in, in these terms. It's not what you have prepared that is important. How many homes, how many cars, how many businesses, how many of this or of that you, you have and your investment and everything. There's something that is more important yet. And I want to say it very clearly this morning because when Jesus will come, there's only be one thing that will be really the most important. Everything else will vanish. Everything else will lose its importance. Like, okay, if you have thousands of dollars in the, your bank account or hundreds of thousands, when you will be with Jesus, will it really be important? Will you be thinking about it? It will disappear. All the troubles, everything, all the difficulties that this life has brought, the, the pressure, the tensions, the disagreements with family members, any disappointment, anything, any crisis, will vanish. It will not be important anymore. That day, there's only one thing that will be important. And what will make the difference is your faith. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that... The, the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold. Your faith, the genuineness of your faith more precious than gold. That is the most important declared in the word of God. And it is repeated throughout in the New Testament. We could look at many, many scriptures uh, stressing the most important things in our lives is our faith. It is what will determine where we are going to spend eternity. Okay, are you uh, agree with me this morning? Okay, and if you look at this text, if we continue more precious than gold that perishes, gold will perish, but when you will stand with Jesus, your gold will not follow you, but some, you will be, you, your life, your soul will be there within the presence of Jesus. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we see an important time, an important moment in your lifetime, a crucial moment, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his second coming. This is important to you. More than any, any other time in your life. More than your wedding day. More than your graduation. More than the promotions you've had at the job. This time, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the most crucial and essential time. It will determine where you're going next. What happened next. And then in this text, we find there's a result here. A result based on your faith, the genuineness of your faith. There's a result. And this result says, if your faith has been tested, this faith that is more precious than gold, it will result in something extraordinary, something wonderful that we should all be looking uh, to this morning. Praise from God 
to you. He will be uh, applaud, uh, in a way applauding or commanding you. Well done. I'm so proud of you. You were faithful. You made it. Like Paul at the end of his life says, I have completed the race. I have made it. I have kept the faith. And Jesus agrees with that. He is looking at each one of us and he is going to declare to us at the end on that day some form of of praise no not that he will worship no not that kind but you know this uh, approval this commendation i'm proud of you you made it you made me proud you were my child i was caring for you and you made it and you you honored me with your life your, your life was pleasing to me the way that you live you made it you believed in me you trusted in me and now your salvation is secure for eternity well done my son well done my daughter come in faith is your most precious possession this morning not your passport not new money, not anything. I remember years ago, my wife and I, we were not Christian. We were uh, hitchhiking uh, from Canada to uh, Mexico. And uh, we were quite uh, young, <laughs> a bit foolish, um, maybe a lot foolish. <laughs> and we were hitchhiking. But we, we knew that in Mexico, we would be robbed. So what we carried with us would be only old t-shirts and, you know, like nothing, we had nothing of value. And we had in our jeans special pocket where we put our passport and our money. So if anything happened, this we have, okay? So that was the most important. And of course, we didn't get ripped off in Mexico. We got ripped off in Oklahoma City. <laughs> We were riding with a guy, he gave us a ride, and he was a big talker. Oh, I will show you the hospitality of Oklahoma. I'll take you to my friend. We'll have parties, blah, blah, blah. And then we were so desperate to go to the bathroom. Just get us to the bathroom. And then when we got to the bathroom, both of us didn't think about our bags. Like, anyway, we had almost nothing in it. We just ran to the bathroom in the car, just boom, just took off. Two o'clock in the morning near a highway in Oklahoma City. And Bridget says, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, we are going to Mexico. So <laughs> <laughs> let's continue. So we went to hiking at two o'clock in the morning and we continued. Anyway, all this to say that there are things that are important at a certain moment of our life. But on that day, nothing like this will be important again. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. And because... Your faith is your most treasured possession. Your enemy, do you have an enemy? Yes. yes, we do have an enemy, but we saw he is so cunning that we forget about him. We don't think about him and all of his snares and all of his traps and all of his lies and all of his distractions and his temptation. We just like walk and don't think about it, but he is there. And he is ferocious, and he is always alert, and he is evil, and he is there to destroy your faith. By any means possible, he will contradict your faith. So if he's going to contradict your faith, means you need to equip yourself to be able to uh, confront the contradictions like through studying the word, understanding the doctrines of the word of God, to be prepared when doubts and attacks from the ungodly people and the philosophies of this life come. That you have an answer, that you have a foundation, that you have uh, the truth is set in your heart. And you know, you know, if you have a flashlight, darkness cannot come. If you have a candle, darkness cannot come. If you have the truth, light cannot come. Because the truth will give you the discernment. He will try to ridicule your faith. Make you just feel like you're stupid, like you're not important, like you're a minority. Uh, that the rest of the world is so smart and you are so stupid. Wow, I'm sorry. 
We are very smart here this morning. You, all of you, you are so smart. Amen? You are the smartest, actually, because you said yes to Jesus Christ. The only salvation. The only way to get to heaven. You, you, you recognized it, and when it passed, and when it knocked at the door of your heart, you says, yes, I want that. You are so smart. You are so smart on that day. And the devil, the devil, if it's not enough to make you feel bad about your faith, or shy, or ashamed of your faith, then you will threaten on your faith. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to, you're going to be out. You know, I'm going to cut you off. He's going to try anything to take away, to shake this faith away because it is the most precious possession that you have. And he knows it. And he knows his time is short. So he will do everything. And he's moving fast. He's very fast. Be careful. I want to show you uh, a slide here with a few different exhortations about what can happen to your faith. Be careful. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit says clearly that in the last times, and the times that are very perilous, some people will abandon the faith. Some people. Okay? Are you among these people? I know many good Christians just like you. I look at you this morning and I see good Christian people who love God, who have said yes to Jesus, who have prayed at times in your life, Lord, anything. Uh, this, the song we sang this morning, I give you my heart, it's yours. You know, every, every, everything I breathe is, is yours. My life is yours. They have committed. I knew Christians who prophesied. They had gifts. I knew Christians who were serving the Lord and excellent, excellent in their ministry. They are not here anymore. They are not here anymore. So some people... Some people will abandon the faith. First Timothy chapter 6, 21. Some people have wandered from their faith. This is more difficult to see. Abandon is like more like by choice or something like that. There's a change. But wandered is like drifting. It's not really being aware, not seeing what's really is happening, not recognizing what is happening in your own personal lives, like being a bit blind to yourself. Some people have wandered from the faith. If you look at different Bible versions, it says, have erred. Uh, they have strayed. They have swerved from. They were going in one direction. Everything was fine with God. But they, something took them into another, another way. Second Peter 2.15 some people forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. That's dangerous. And the text continues and says, they have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Okay, corruptions, uh, cheating, deceit, uh, love of money, or whatever. We continue, 1 Timothy 6.10, we are very familiar with this text. For which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There are many dangers on the way of faith and the adventure of faith on the way of faith in our lives. There are many, many things that the devil knows how to use. 1 Timothy 1.18 and 19. Talking, Paul talking to Timothy about the prophecies concerning his ministry and his calling. May they, the prophecies, help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliber deliber deliberately sorry, <laughs> violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. It's sad because these people were there in the Lord. They, these people were fighting the Lord's battle. They, you know, and all of us, we have a conscience. The voice of the Spirit is there to, to stir up our conscience. This is right. This is wrong. This is safe. This is dangerous. Don't venture there. Don't do this. And we have the, the inner voice, the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. But here it says that some people have deliberately violated their conscience. They didn't listen 
to that voice. The warnings of the Holy Spirit and their faith have been shipwrecked. So there are many things that can happen in, uh, in, in our own life to, to, to do that. I, I looked at this verse with uh, e easy to read version. This is how it says, I want you to remember those prophecies and fight the good fight of faith. Continue to trust in God and do what you know is right. Some people have not done this and their faith is now in ruins. Listen to your conscience. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, when you are born again, when you believe in Jesus, you are so privileged and you are so blessed. The Holy Spirit, the life of God, the qualities, the attributes of God come and uh, begin a process of transformation. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He is our companion. He is the guide of our salvation. His mission is to take you by the hand and to lead you to eternity. It is the mission of the Holy Spirit. He is your best friend. He is your security. Walk by the Spirit, the Bible says. Be filled with the Spirit. Be, there's, a, there's a reason why the Bible says that. Because the Holy Spirit does something. He has a mission. He is, his mission is for you. This is a time of grace. Jesus is your high priest. He says, I'm not leaving you orphans. It is to your advantage I'm going away. The Holy Spirit will come. He will be with you forever. I will not leave you orphans. Amen? Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. Again, we are reminded. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. These words is if, if indeed you continue. And that is bit the, the message that I have in mind for you. The, your, your most precious possession is your faith. But my... My theme this morning is the continuation of your faith, is the progress of your faith. It's what happened to your faith over time, over going through different valleys and mountains and different situations. If indeed you continue in your faith, and how can you continue in your faith? Grounded. Grounded and steadfast. Grounded and steadfast here uh, tells me something here. It tells me that you have a responsibility to, in order to make your, your, your faith uh, grounded or make your faith uh, steadfast. You have something to do here. If it is going to be grounded, you need to put it in the ground. You need to dig for this. Something you must do. You know, we are privileged again because the Holy Spirit does a lot. That is called grace. God does a lot for us. But there are things that He leaves to us that's obedience. That is faith and action. That is love. That is, you know, doing the simple things. Uh, some of us, we call it the discipline of the Christian life. Uh, the means of grace. The means of growth. There are things that are being left to you and obedience. If you dwell in me, you know, you will bear fruit. If you keep my word, you will be set free. Like, you know, you have all of these if that the Lord, if you love me, you will do what I have commanded you. So you have, you have all of these things. Pray all the time. You know, uh, when you are worried about something, bring it to God. Trust the Lord. Uh, pay your tithes. Uh, read your Bible. Do your devotions. Uh, renew your, your life every day in the Lord. Spend time with the Lord. These are something that you must do. Nobody else will do it for you. The Holy Spirit cannot do these things for you. The Holy Spirit will do a lot of things for you. But there are things that you must do in accord with the Word of God. It is something you must do to be walking in the same direction with the Holy Spirit. You must do these things. You must be grounded. You must be, you know, getting your, your faith steadfast. Amen? Amen? That is called discipline and determination. And God, again, helps you to do these things. He encourages you.
He, 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 he brings his, his mind into yours and he gives you courage. I'm reading the New Living Translation from this verse. Don't drift away from the assurance you receive when you heard the good news. The easy to read version. You must not let anything cause you to give up the hope that became yours when you heard the good news. The Good News Bible. You must not allow yourselves to be shaken from the hope. All the same thing said differently, but it carries a di little something different uh, in, in that warning and this exhortation. Don't drift away from the assurance you receive. Don't, you must not let anything cause you to give up the hope. And you must not allow yourself to be shaken from the hope. Hold on, hold on, continue, work on that. Keep your faith. The New Testament is filled with similar exhortation. And these texts that we just looked at help us see how Christians can be easily straying away. You can be brought into a, a, wrong, a wrong place and not hold on to the confidence that they had at the beginning. What will happen if you do not have this steadfast confidence. Uh, what will happen if you do not ground your faith, if you, it's not steadfast and renewed and alive, and it just go declining and drifting and shaken and all of this? First thing, you will make many, many, many poor decisions in your life. You will be a person of poor decision because there's no faith to help you make the right decision. You know, this, this decision that will cost you something, but that will honor God, you will not be able to take that kind of decisions. You will not have that kind of courage. You will not have this sorts of, uh, you know, the little voice in your conscience and, uh, you know, the clarity of mind and the discerning of the, what is the best. You will go for what's easy, what comes first, whatever circumstance, you will follow whatever influence comes in your way. You will be wavering in all of this. That's the first thing that will happen to you. You will make many, many poor decisions and you will be aiming in the wrong directions. And it will affect your marriage life. It will affect your career, the priorities of your life. You will be weak. You will be powerless, you will be unable to resist, unable to uh, fight back, unable to endure, and unable to be courageous for the name of the Lord. Because there's no reason, there's, there's no uh, structure to, to support you, there's no faith there. People who say that religion is for the weak, I can tell you they don't know what they are talking about. Because it takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage today to stand for Jesus Christ and this dark world. And you need to be strong for that. Very, very strong. And if your faith is not as strong as your mind intends to be, you will not make it. You will not make it. They will get to you. Because there's too much ungodliness. There's too much, uh, you, you know, yeah, ungodliness, wickedness, like darkness and everything in this world going against the gospel. If you want to make it, you better be strong. Amen? Amen. That was a bit weak, but, you know, I know your brain is working this morning, so it's fine. You know, we know these wonderful texts like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And, yeah, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's so encouraging. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Yes. Wonderful throne of grace. A grace with, you know, a throne where grace just flows out to touch you and to meet you and any of your needs. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow. It's so wonderful, isn't it? But if you do not have that steadfast confidence, this verse, as wonderful it is, will mean nothing to you. And it will mean nothing because you will not go to the throne of grace. You will not run with boldness because there's no faith. There's no life, you know, in you to put, put you there. We know this verse, but it won't be of any benefit unless your faith and your confidence is renewed. So that when the crisis happens and this time of need comes, that you will run to. You will remember, I must run to the throne because it's fresh in your mind. And when I touch the throne, I will receive grace and whatever I, I, I need. But if you don't have 
that strong confidence, it will not come to your mind to even think in this way. And I want to give you an example of that. It will be very clear. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. There was a rich man who had a manager. Well, we have many managers in this room here this morning. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possession. Okay, let's stop there. Very serious situation, very normal situation for all of us here. We all have work, we all earn money, and our job is important to us. But here's the serious situation. This man is losing his job. He's a manager. He makes money. He is a person of influence and status. And he is desperate. He is very desperate. When you lose your job, aren't you desperate? When you change employer, when they, they cancel your contract, when they insult you on the job, they make you feel like you're nothing. Yes, we feel desperate. We don't know where to turn and what to do. And this man says, what am I going to do? You know the story, so I'm just going a bit uh, further. Uh, what am I going to do? I cannot beg. I'm too proud for that. I cannot go and you know, become a construction worker. I cannot dig the, the ground. You know, I, I'm not strong enough. I've never done that. I have no more muscles. I've, uh, I can, uh, my muscles are in my finger and only my, my brain. So I'm, I, I can't do this. You know, What am I going to do? So he says, okay. As a good Christian, he goes to the throne of grace. God, help me. Is that true? No. What does he do first? He finds his own solution. What is his own solution? Dishonesty. That's one of the best trick of anybody here. Just lie. Make believe. You know? Uh, steal something. or Be a crook like they are to you. Just be a crook to them. You know? And this is what he does. In verse 8, we see that after the story. He's, he's telling other customers... Uh, how much do you owe my, my boss? Uh, you owe 100 barrel of oil? Okay, write 50 here. You know? He's just making friends and he's preparing his retirement. So when I retire, I can find all of these friends so they will take care of me because I made them save so much money. So verse 8, the master commanded the dishonest manager, we call him the shrewd manager, for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Who are the sons of light? Us. We are the sons of light. And who are the sons of their own generation? Or these, the, the, the people of the sons of this world? They are the ungodly. The ones who do not have the spirit of God in them. But they are clever. They are shrewd. They can use this honesty. That's why the... the What's the word for that? The, the stock market, you know, vanished and fell. That's why we ha keep having problems in this world. Because the, the sons of this world are shrewd. They are so clever. They just steal you to the left and to the right. Any banking or any, you know, whatever. You know all of that. So let's not go there. So... The master commanded the dishonest manager. And this is important for us to not get confused on that text. And I think you already heard sermon on this. What did the shrewd manager think of doing when he was in trouble? He didn't run boldly to the throne of grace. Lord, indicate to me what to do. What should I do? Open a door for me. Bless me as I'm going out. Lord, I repent for my uh, you know, dishonesty from the past. Help me to have a, a clean uh, exit here and find something for my future. He doesn't do that. He first turned to dishonesty. That is his uh, solution, to save his own skin. And that is what people will tend to do any of you, me included, if our faith is not renewed and our steadfastness is not based and grounded in the Lord, we will turn and we will find the, what seems to be an easy solution. Just tell a lie. Nobody will care really. You don't know. You will save your skin. Just, you know, be shrewd, you know, and dishonest. So that's what he did. Even if it was wrong, he still used this dishonesty as his first solution. 
and he was very good at being dishonest. He was commanded to be shrewd, okay? So it reminds me one of the texts that we just looked before. Some people have deliberately violated their conscience. That's what he does. This is wrong, but that's what he does. His conscience is telling him it's wrong. Everybody, every child that have decent parents in this society have been educated. It is wrong to steal. It is wrong to lie. Everybody knows that. It's black and white. This man knew it, but he violated his conscience, and then you shipwreck after that. Here is the lesson. The lesson is not to be good at being dishonest, okay? Don't, don't try that. Don't try that at home, okay? <laughs> what the steward did was unjust, and he was not commended for being a crook, but he was commended for his foresight. He was commended for acting prudently. That's the purpose of this lesson. And there is a comparison between the son of this world and the son of the light. So the son of this light, according to this man example, have prepared his future here on earth. How much more, if we know that our future is not in this earth, are we to prepare our future in heaven? to be as shrewd, to be as uh, working diligently, thinking of ways to prepare our future and what counts and what is eternal. That's the lesson of this text here. That is this lesson. And here, of course, it use, you use money because money is so important to us. Like already in my two little stories that I told you, I mentioned money many times and passport and all of this. So it is part of our daily life. When you exit this room this morning, you will use money to pay your lunch. You, you, we, we work with money. We, we need money. And this is important to us. But as we do, there is a God. There is a provider. There is a blessing. There is a, a good and a, and a wrong way to go about money. And my faith will indicate me which one I have to follow in order to please my Lord, my Savior. Amen? Amen. And investing in the eternal blessing of men and women, we are preparing a welcoming committee in heaven. Amen? You know, you invest in mission, you give to the salvation. You invest your unrighteous money. The money that you can use to be dishonest and to be a crook, you use it to save the soul of someone. That is pleasing to the Lord. And that is preparing a welcoming committee uh, for you. This summer I was in Canada and, uh, you know, the... the heart of Canadian is very hard to the gospel. There's, there's, they don't want to hear about it. This is very hard to share the gospel at this moment. But we were so blessed because for the last few years, our church and many other church in our hometown are becoming, I live in the agricultural part of, of Quebec and Canada, and we have the, the Christian Canadian Farmers Association. And because it is an agricultural uh, location, we have these huge festivals, these huge exposures, and they bring their cows, they bring their whatever animals, the big tractors, and every night they have like some, uh, some shows, like the strongest tractors are pulling, it can, it's, uh, the whole town, you hear, you know, the whole night and everything. So that's very important. You have Tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who, who go there. It's impossible to find a, st a, st a place to, to park your car. Every household use their lawn, their account, and they make money to just give, give parking. It's very important. It's big. And when it finishes in that city, it moves to the next city. And after that city, they move to the next. And it lasts the whole summer. You know, in Canada, it's so cold. So summer is so important. We do everything in the summer. So... These people, they invest, and they have a, a, a place that they, they run there, and they give away something. The first year that I remember, they were giving like walking stick with message of the gospel, and they would use it to preach the gospel. And it was so popular 
It was so popular, people would come and tell each other, where did you take this walking stick? I took it there. And people would go there and hear the gospel and have discussion, and it was extraordinary to a point where the devil, I believe, uh, took all of the authorities of the places. Uh, you cannot give these walking stick anymore because, you know, it's too dangerous. People can use it to maybe to cause trouble or whatever. <laughs> so they couldn't. But they found other ways. They found other ways. This year they were doing with, uh, I think, uh, little beads, colors, colors and uh, they have things. They have ways. And they just continue and they just continue and they invest. And it's all free. It's all free, and people are touched. The children, the parents, they are touched. Why are you giving us something? Nothing is free in this world uh, because we are Christian and all this, and they share the gospel to hundreds of thousands of people that normally would, don't talk to me about God, and it is wonderful to see that. Another example is Luke chapter 16 as well, verse 19 to 22. There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. Okay, here is another man who has a lifestyle in this world and uh, doesn't care about anybody. Doesn't make the difference between the dogs and a man that is poor. There's no difference for him. But you know that we read in this text, both of them died. And after he died, he became very evangelistic. Suddenly, what's important has changed. What was important before, not important anymore. I beg you, Father Abraham, send anybody to my five brothers so that they will not go and come in and, and help, you know, where I am in torment over here. Change suddenly. There's something important ahead of us. And let's not wait until we get there and are disappointed. But instead, this man had no reason to change. He continued to live recklessly until he woke up. He woke up dead. That's a strange expression. But, you know, it's a real expression because you wake up when you're dead. When you're dead, you're not gone. You're very much alive in another form, in another shape, and this is for eternity. And he became very, very, very evangelistic. Ananias and Sapphira lied to God, the Holy Spirit, in the church. They were church members just like us. You know, like these conflicts in church and the flesh that comes in church all over the world? That is a good example. They sold a piece of land, and here it says, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? That was yours. You didn't have to lie about it. You don't want to give your money, don't give it. You don't want to sell your land, don't, don't sell it. It is yours. After it was sold, wasn't it all of your disposal? Even if you sell it, it's still your money. Do whatever you want, it's your money. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart with his wife and himself? You have not lied to man, but to God. You know, and we, we look at the text previously, they have strayed from the faith in their greediness. That's a very good example of that. The greediness, they have strayed from the faith. They are part of the church. And not only that, if you look closely to the text, you will realize they were familiar with Peter. They just walked to Peter. You know, Peter is the senior pastor. He's, he's the great guy. The church was big at that time. And they just have direct access to Peter. They know him. They walk to him. They talk to him. Like they were influential people. They were people that people considered them as very spiritual. They could have been like deacons or whatever you, you can be. But they have lied at the same time to the Holy Spirit because they have strayed from the faith and their greediness. And this happens in church. How many times we have heard in this church here in the past, oh, I've lent money to these sisters and she had such a good stories and she took off to the U.S. and uh, she never paid me, paid me back my, my money, you know. <laughs> Second Timothy 4.10, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Simple, everyday attractions. No flirting with the world, being attracted by the world. All sorts of ordinary daily situation pertaining to our job, to our families, the happens to our life, crises that test our faith. Same things with grudges, anger, unforgiving, unforgiving hearts. 
it would not be possible to overcome these unless you maintain a firm confidence. If you don't have that firm confidence, you will not let go. You will have no peace. And it's not fair. And I'm going to get to that person. I'm not letting him win over me. And this is so strong. And you cannot let go unless you have a faith in God. God will take care of that person. God will take care of you so that you will be free. Romans 12, 19, 21. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. And I'm not putting all the verse for sake of time. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. If you don't have that steadfast, firm, and renewed confidence, there's no way you can do that. And then closing, Hebrews 10.23, we are reminded to hold fast to our confidence. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope with, without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. You see, my confidence that there is a heaven that I'm going to be there with Jesus is a hope. It's based on a hope. That hope comes from a promise it, that I have heard about in the gospel. That's what we, we're reading about. So why am I so crazy about God? Why am I so persevering? Why am I depriving myself from all the vices of this world that could possibly bring some satisfaction to my flesh? Why am I cutting myself from going in that direction? And why do I force myself to be honest? Why do we make choices that honor God in our life? Because we believe fully, completely, that the one who made that promise that became my hope is faithful, he is truthful, he is reliable, he is trustworthy. That's my faith. That's why I want to hold fast to that. Hebrew 10, 35, 39. So, do not throw away this confident trust or your confidence in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will then you will receive all that he has promised wow so wonderful so wonderful the NIV says it will be your confidence will be richly rewarded I love it so much it will be richly rewarded hold on wait for it continue don't lose don't give up don't waver, just hold on. It will be richly rewarded. Amen? Amen. And this text, just before, if you look at, uh, let, let, let me just, just look here for a moment because I want to read it to you. In Hebrew chapter 10, verse 32, and I will read it from the message because it is it's so cool the way that he writes about that. Remember those early days after you first saw the light, okay? You became a Christian, you had, you know, so excited and love with Jesus, you were, you saw the light. So, wow, everything's so important now, everything's new. Those were the hard times, kicked around in public, targets of every kind of abuse. Some days it was you, other days your friends. If some friends went to prison, you stuck by them. If some enemies broke in and seized your goods, you let them go with a smile, knowing they couldn't touch your real treasure. Nothing they did bothered you. Nothing set you back. And that's the background to what we are reading now. So don't throw away this confidence that you have, this assurance, this joy, this hope that you had that was so wonderful, exciting that you had because it will be richly rewarded. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. He is coming, but sometimes we forget about that because we are so caught up in the business of this world and this materialistic society. We forget to talk about it and to uh, nourish our, our hope and the promise. In just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones, that's you and me, will 
in this kind of world and this kind of situation, good or bad, whatever happens, just like a married couple when you pronounce your vows, good times, bad times, whatever happens, I will be faithful to you as long as I live. I will love you. My righteous ones will live by faith. And God says, I take no pleasures and anyone who turns away. God cannot take pleasure in that. He has paid too much of a price on the cross of Calvary. His blood, the ransom, he gave his life for your life. His blood was shed. But then the conclusion of that, and it is your conclusion, can you read it with me? And let it be your con conclusion this morning. Leave this place with this confidence, but, together, but, we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destructions. We are the faithful ones whose soul will be saved, or will be preserved, it will be kept to be with Jesus forever. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. We live in 